Good morning, church. Such an honour to be sharing the Word with you this morning. Just also want to welcome Chapel, everybody in Chapel this morning. So good to have you here and sharing the Word together. And also a big shout out to Melbourne. Melbourne, we love you. We're praying for you. And even though you may be locked down, you are not locked out of the presence and power of God. He is right where you are today and He knows where you are. So thank you, team. You're amazing. We'll see you back soon. Well, today we're going to be talking about the last of a series that we've been doing actually on assembly required. Anybody here need some assembly required in your life or your relationships? I certainly do. And, you know, relationships are such a complex part of our relational world and of our lives. I looked up what complex meant this week and I thought that just sounds just like us and our relationship. It says, consisting of many different and connected parts, a whole made up of complicated or interrelated parts. That's who you and I are. Made up of many different parts, the Bible says we're one body with many different parts made for relationship by God. And I just um, encourage you, if you didn't hear Pastor Paul's message last week, it was a very amazing word that he talked about relate on relational depth. You can get it on the podcast, but last week he talked about how relational depth, depth understands lasting foundations go deep. In other words, he talked about how it's a committed investment to have depth we have to have that committed investment. It doesn't happen overnight. He also talked about how relational depth, depth understands, I can't say that word today, two-way investment is required. We're all under construction, aren't we? So we have to realise that there's a two-way investment that is required, not just a one way. He also talked about how re- relational depth understands that failure is part of the journey. And in our relationships, we need to give room to journey together. And today I want to talk about how Jesus had demonstrated some relational keys that um, we can all learn from in our relationships. Keys that unlocked and produced harvest. Keys that unlocked and produced release. Keys that unlocked and produced security. And keys that unlocked and produced empowerment. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you. It is light to our understanding and it's a pathway for us to walk. And we honour your word today, God, and I pray you help us to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Some of you in the room today may remember an old rocker called Tina Turner. I looked up online actually this week and she's 82 years old. She looks pretty good too. Maybe had a little help along the way, I don't know, but she looks pretty good. But she has a song, some of you may remember, What's Love Got to Do, Got to Do With It. I'll spare you and not sing, spare your ears this morning, and particularly the actions that she uses. But What's Love Got to Do, Got to Do With It. What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Sadly, the world's view on love is that it is just an emotion. It is just a feeling. It's not a commitment, not something that needs our intentional focus, or assembly required, like we've been talking about, but more about how I feel, about me, about my wants, how it makes me feel. And often, you know, we can drift without even realising, but so drifted so far from Jesus' heart and commands in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 to 39. I love how the Passion puts it. It says, love the Lord your God, with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being and with every thought that is within you. And you must love your friend 
in the same way you love yourself. The Amplified Version says, unselfishly seek the best or highest good for others. It doesn't say love others when they do what you want them to do or love others when we feel like it or love others depending on what we do or don't get. It just says to love as he has loved us. And in Matthew twenty-two thirty-five 35 to 36, there was a lawyer who was very, um, an expert, the Bible says, in the Mosaic law. And he came to Jesus and asked which of those commandments that he had given were the, the most important. And Jesus responded back with the two that I just read. And then he said in verse 40, contained within these commandments to love, you will find all the meaning of the law and the prophets. The NIV says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And when we know what it is to abandon ourselves in his love, when we have immersed ourselves in the love that God has shown to us and extended to us, when we embrace it, we find out who we really are. We are in him. And when we know who we are, we have a foundation to be able to love others from that place. The foundation that will accept not only ourselves, but accept other people. Loving God first, ourselves from that place, is an empowering place to be. It's actually pivotal, Jesus said, to our existence. Pivotal to our relationships, that we hang everything on those two commandments, loving God passionately with all our heart and then loving not only ourselves from that place but others also from that place. So the question today is, is God our first love? Is he really, are we really devoted to him? Because when we're devoted to him, we offer others the greatest gift that we could give in our relationships. He is what completes us. And then our marriages, our relationships are an addition to that. They're not filling a gap in our life that no one else can fill but that love from our heavenly father. Another question is, do we own a personal revelation of God's love. Not just have heard about it or read about it, but do we actually own that? Is our confidence in who we are out of that revelation in God and God's love for us? Because when we have a personal revelation, it instills acceptance and a sense of belonging and security. And lastly, are we loving others from that revelation of love. When we embrace God's love and acceptance, it enables us to love with a pure heart, with pure motives, not selfish. And any relationship takes intentionality. I don't know about your relationships, but I know I have had to be intentional with my relationships. And Jesus was so intentional about his relationship with us. We heard about it in communion when Pastor Luke talked about how he went all the way to the cross for us. He was very intentional about his love so that we could experience God's love. His intentions were outworked in actions. No good having good intentions without action to follow through on that. You know, before I, be, before I became a Christian, I was searching for love, which is another song, but in all the wrong places <laughs> and from all the wrong people. And I came up empty. I experienced firsthand the devastation of that secondhand, selfish, what's in it for me emotion. And it did not build into my life. It did not add into my life, it's, it took away from me. It depleted me. Eugene Peterson says, love is the background which everything else 
is played out. So true. We know that was the case in Jesus' life and what he modelled to us. He is the best person to learn from when it comes to relationships. He loved God with all his heart and all his passion and then he loved others from that place of intimacy with God. So if loving God is the background and foundation to our lives and loving of others from that foundation, you would think that our relationships would be amazing, that our relationships would be becoming more solid, more stable, more secure, more sound. Could the disharmonies that we face in our relational worlds, and we all face them, be because we don't actually really fully live from these two commandments. Maybe we're not living from what we think we already knew. So I just want to look at some relational keys this morning that Jesus modelled. Are you with me online? Are you with me, Melbourne? Good, I can hear you. <laughs> Do you know our words are living His words were life-giving. One of the things that Jesus modelled was the harvest of building words. This is so big in our relational words that we speak with words that build up each other. That's what Jesus did. He spoke truth, but he spoke words that had a harvest that grew people. His his words were life-giving. He was very careful to speak from the wisdom and grace of his Father. I know I don't always speak from the wisdom and grace of my Father. I speak before I think sometimes. And there are many examples where Jesus spoke kind words over people, giving words, words that brought life. I love how Psalm 45, 2 in the Passion puts it, elegant grace pours out through every word you speak. There are many, many examples, but I think about the woman with the issue of blood came to Jesus so downhearted because of her circumstances and most likely cruel words that had been spoken over her by those around her because of the the issue she had in her life. Came to him probably with fear and shame But you know what Jesus did? He called her daughter. He spoke kindness over her life. And those kind words literally brought a life flow into her body. The power of our words can strengthen, can build up, bring healing, but they also have the power to tear down. Ephesians 4.29 says, Never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. Mother Teresa says, Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. Our words have the ability to create a harvest. The opposite to being generous with our words is unkind, inconsiderate, insensitive. And Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 55, when you speak healing words, you offer fruit from the tree of life, but unhealthy negative words do nothing but crush their hopes. So how generous are we with our words to one another? When we think about it in our relationships, maybe in our marriages, if you're married today, in our relationships, in our family relationships, how generous. I don't know we can all be guilty at times of having words that we're not building words, not building the right kind of harvest. And for Paul and I, you know, we, when it comes to conflict, are very different. I'm a processor and Paul's a resolver. And there have been many times along the way where we have had to dig deep to find those kind words as we journey to get to the resolve. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about out there? (laughs) But we have to commit to responding, not reacting. Because words are life-giving. They're actually living. Words are living. If I was to ask the question, how many can recall today of harsh words that have been spoken over your life? Immediately, I recalled as I was preparing this message, these words don't have any power over me today, but they once had a lot of power over my life when my mother married a man called Bob when I was 15. And let's just say Bob and I came into conflict often. And one day he told me that I was trash that belonged in a garbage and that he would gladly put the lid on me. And you know, that was 46 years late ago but I still remember those words today. But because of Jesus, they have no power over my life today. (laughs) Equally so, how many can recall the impact of kind words that were spoken over your life? Words that encouraged and built into you. My father-in-law's name was also Bob, a very kind, encouraging man. In fact, it's his birthday today if he was here. With us, he'll be partying in heaven today. But his name was also Bob, which I think is quite amazing. (laughs) But he always said to me, after I emceed or spoke any time that I was up here, whether it was good or not, he always came to me and said, you go, girly, you're doing great. Do you know those short, kind words were life-giving to me? They spoke life and encouragement into me. Not having a dad since I was a little girl of 10, those affirming, encouraging words were life. They were building words. They were words that had a harvest in my life. It doesn't take much on our part to say, you're doing great. In other words, I believe in you, but it can make a world of difference to the person, a life-giving difference. So Jesus demonstrated to us the harvest of building words and giving words. And he also demonstrated the release of undeserved forgiveness. This is huge. Something I think we could all identify at some stage if you haven't had somebody that you've had to forgive so far, more power to you. But somewhere along our life, But Jesus modelled forgiveness. He was forgiving, full stop. And he shows us that it is possible to forgive beyond ourselves, to forgive when it seems unreasonable, when it seems unattainable. He looked beyond human frailty, our human frailty, human frailty around him to his father and he surrendered to his love in spite of his earthly reality. He didn't just pretend stuff wasn't going on or people hadn't heard him, but he surrendered it to his father. And in Luke 23, 34, it says that while he was, they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and over, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He modelled the ultimate example to us of forgiveness. And the power of forgiveness builds freedom. Psychologist Dr. Robbie Sonderegger says, forgiveness is healing in action. It's not until you extend the gift of forgiveness that you discover that the gift is really intended for you. You know, I remember after becoming a Christian, being faced with a decision to forgive somebody who had interfered with me, abused me as a young child. And the wrestle was real. It was something that the Holy Spirit had put his finger on and highlighted to me that I needed to deal with. The wrestle was real, but so was the awareness that my heart needed freeing, that I needed to be free. And I've come to realise that the power of forgiveness and the power of that forgiveness 
wasn't just for me, not just for the other person even, but also for others. And I have had many, many opportunities to speak into people's situations where they've held on to unforgiveness. And I have been able to encourage them firsthand. Nothing like firsthand. Because you can't take that away from me. And they encouraged and they could also find freedom. I'll never forget and was so impacted by a lady that came to my office when we were back in 95 Mount Eden Road. And she had terminal cancer. And somebody had given her my book. She came into my office. She was older than me at the time. And tears started rolling down her face. Been horribly abused as a child. Had a a lot of things gone down in her life. Tears streaming down her face saying, the difference between you and me is I'm still a victim. I'm not free. And there we sat in the office as I prayed for her. Tears streaming down her face. And the presence of Jesus came into that room. The healer came into the room and healed her heart as she let go and forgave. Maybe it's not always possible to be face-to-face with somebody. That doesn't matter. Maybe some people that hurt you have passed away, but your heart knows whether it's free or not. And it's your heart that you have to focus on to get that freedom. C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Powerful. Do you know, we cannot stand before the cross. Now that I know Jesus, I cannot stand before the cross. We cannot stand before the cross and hold unforgiveness in our hearts. The cross represents forgiveness we didn't deserve and we need to also extend that forgiveness to others. Last week, Pastor Paul said, forgiveness determines whether we empower or release past pain. You know, I understand in this room today there are different levels. There are different levels of pain. And I may not know your pain, but I do know pain. And I do understand different levels in my own life when it comes to forgiveness. But his love reaches to all levels of pain. There is none that is too hard. All levels of pain, we just need to allow it. And for some, that may be a journey. And that's okay, as long as you take the journey. Jesus understands that. It can be a journey, but I just, I just encourage you today, please do not hold on to it because you're the one whose heart will be bound if you don't let it go. So he modelled the harvest of giving words, the release of forgiving, and also the security of integrity. He was authentic. He was integrous. He was transparent. He lived and walked out his convictions. He did not say one thing and live another. In John 14, 9, 10, Jesus replied to Philip, I've been with you all this time and you still don't know who I am. How could you ask me to show you the Father? For anyone who has looked at me has seen the Father. Don't you believe that the Father is living in me and I am living in the Father? Even my words are not my own but come from my Father. For he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. Jesus' integrity was solid. He lived as an ambassador of heaven. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, the Bible tells us that we are ambassadors. An ambassador is someone that presents and demonstrates all the best that their hometown or government has to offer. Well, our hometown is heaven. I love that. We live out 
What we live out, the power of godly integrity builds trust, respect and security because our actions speak louder than our words. Mark Victor Hansen says, the wind might cause a kite to rise, but what keeps it up up there is the fact that somebody on the ground has a steady hand. Hold steady to your values, your integrity. It's your anchor. You let go of that. It isn't long before the kite comes crashing down. Sad but true. When I was a young girl, I had a, a young Christian, a job in a receptionist. I was a receptionist to four salespeople and the bo- their boss. And um, I did all their secretarial duties. And knowing that I was a Christian, they were always trying to pay me out or get me to do something to see whether I was genuine or not. And it used to really annoy me. I really had to make sure that I kept that (laughs) good uh, witness to them that they were trying to break down in my life. But they would, for instance, there were clients that would ring in that they hadn't followed up and done the right work and they would want me to lie on the phone to their client when I was trying to get the call through to them. And I'd say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm not gonna do that. And they would get really frustrated with me. But unknowing to me, the big boss had been observing my life, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect, by the way, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but this is just an illustration. And there was something confidential that he needed done, and he came to me to do it. And I had no idea that I had even earned his trust because I wouldn't do things that they were asking me to do. But the, uh, the flip side of that, there, were, there was a girl there, a saleswoman, and one of the uh, PAs to the bigger boss, Both, I invited them to church, both came to church and both got saved. And I was like, that is so awesome. (laughs) Jesus modelled a harvest of giving words, the release of forgiving, the security of integrity, and then lastly, the empowerment of unconditional love. He loved unconditionally. He didn't just love some people. He loved unconditionally. He shows us how to love without strings attached. I don't know about you, but that has been a challenge in my Christian walk or my walk as a human to love without strings attached. He modelled to us that unconditional love doesn't run out. It, does, it makes sacrifices and it isn't earned, but it's freely given. 1 John 4, 9 to 10 said, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, when we extend that unconditional love to others, we are extending the heart of Jesus to others. We are extending and releasing and building into their life. When I talked about forgiveness, you know, that forgiveness freed me. But when we extend unconditional love to others, it brings release and freedom to them. The word unconditional means something done, given freely without anything being required in return, without condition, without reservation. 1 John 4, 19 in the Passion says, our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. It's huge. You know, those two commandments, I think we could meditate on them for the rest of our life. So they really saturate into the very core of who we are so that we can experience what, God is talking about. Unconditional love is loving others, not because they're like us, not because they do what we want them to do, do things the way we want, but loving despite differences, just like Jesus did and does for us. He loved us while we were sinners. He didn't love us because we were good enough or we ticked off the box of His requirements. He just loved us. It's a big challenge to all of us not to have an agenda when it comes to loving people. Knowing that first love, 
loving others from that place enables us to have healthy foundation to give to others. It gives strength to our relationships in the good and the challenging times. I'm gonna finish with Hebrews 12, two to three in the message. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how He did it, because He never lost sight of where He was headed. The exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now He's there in the place of honour, right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story item by item, that long litany of hostility He ploughed through, because that will shoot adrenaline in your souls. It's powerful. Jesus is fully committed to us. He went all the way so that we can be in relationship with the Father and live in the fullness of His love. So what's love got to do with it in response to Tina Turner? His love has got everything to do with it. Amen. Amen.